everyone. Welcome to Net 207. We're going to dive deep into the current security threat landscape today, and we're excited to be here with you. We're going to talk about DDoS and the threat vectors that we see trending today. We're going to discuss uh, how you can protect yourself around DDoS and web applications. So we're going to talk about web application vulnerabilities and the top trending vulnerabilities that we're seeing. We're also going to discuss botnets and the good work that we're doing to get around the corner to see what's out there developing in the wild so that not only we can protect the infrastructure services that we're providing to you, but you can protect your applications. We're excited also to extend a look into the threat landscape as we look at the accounts and what's trending as far as threats in the accounts. We know that the threat landscape doesn't end at the edge, right? So we're excited to talk about that. And we're not going to end there. We're going to discuss how you can mitigate these threats. We're going to give you a best practices and remediation. Um, we're going to hit the high points on them. Of course, we can't be exhaustive here, but uh, I'm excited to be here with you. My name is Steve. I'm a partner solutions architect for security at AWS, and I have the pleasure of working with our security partners and our services teams. How many security partners are here today? Any security partners in the room? Excellent. Thank you for coming. It's great to have you here. Um, I'm joined here by Fola. Fola is a security engineer, and he works with the anti-DDoS DDoS organization on our shield response team. So how many people are glad that we have a 24 by 7 shield response team to help you with DDoS in case you ever have a DDoS event, right? Excellent. So I'm excited to have Fola here with me. Fola sits at the front lines. He sees this. Uh, threats come in every day, and he knows exactly what he's talking about and how to best protect against those. So uh, with that, this is our, uh, these are our contacts. You know, we're not going to have a lot of extra time today, so we're not going to be able to stop along the way for questions. But we will uh, come down at the end, and if you can spare the time, you can come talk to us. We'll uh, answer any questions that you might have. Um, and so feel free to email us if you can't. Um, and so we're, what we're going to do, I'm going to share with you some data. We're going to share data with you um, from several of our services that we've collected. Because again, this is a perspective of threats from the internet to AWS, and so we've collected data points from these various sources within AWS. Um, and that's where we're going to be sharing with you. So this is actual data, not theoretical, right? And so we think you're going to find it interesting. So take a look at those. Those are our sources. Also, as we go along, we're going to discuss different services and ways to uh, mitigate threats, and these services aren't necessarily security services, but you should be familiar with those because they help you to identify and detect threats as well as respond to them uh, quickly. And so just be familiar with those as we go along. A high-level agenda here today, um, so take a look at that. Um, one thing I would ask up front from you is please provide us with feedback let us know what you liked about this session. If you appreciate us sharing this data, um, this is the first time we've done a session like this at reInvent where we've discussed uh, the threat landscape from so many different perspectives. And so we really do value your feedback and would like to understand how this, how this data is useful to you so that we can better share in the future. With that, I'm gonna turn it over to Fola so he can kick us off with our first topic. Fola. Thank you, Steve. Hello, everyone. Um, as Steve introduced, my name is Fola. I'm on the Shield Response team. We are incident responders that essentially help out with customers whenever they are DDoS attacks. Um, my team is within the Perimeter Protection Organization. And um, I don't operate in isolation. I think if my team were on stage today, they would want you to take away certain things from Sorry. this conversation. Sorry. Um, the most important thing I think we want to take away is that AWS does a lot of things for you. Um, in terms of protecting you from threats at the perimeter. And we would like you to know those things, but also equally importantly is that we would like for you to leverage the infrastructure and the best practices that I'll be showing you today so that you protect yourself against these common threats and then we both can work together against those more nuanced um, threats that you know, we may see depending on the use case or industry that you're in. Um, so let's take a look at um, what we have today. Um, so, at AWS, security is a top priority. And within the Perimeter Protection Organization, the organization which I'm in, 
um, we are focused on ensuring that this infrastructure is always available regardless of the threats that we face, because we do face threats. Um, parameter protection may be a new word or phrase to you, and what it essentially is is um, a group of services such as AWS Shield, AWS Web Application Firewall, AWS Network Firewall, AWS Firewall Manager, a bunch of firewall services I know. But um, we also have internal services and a bunch of brilliant engineers that work internally that don't face customers who build the services, build the mitigations that automatically detect and mitigate, um, build the systems that automatically detect and mitigate these threats. Um, I'd like you to turn your attention to the diagram up here. What you see is a representation of the AWS infrastructure. Um, this infrastructure comprises of over 30 regions, over 96 availability zones, over 410 points of presences. Why do I say that? It's important to know this because this means that AWS is put in a very unique position on the world stage. We are able to see a large chunk of the traffic on the internet. That's most of the traffic on the internet is either going towards AWS or out of AWS because we've built one of the world's largest network infrastructures. With this infrastructure, we have the ability to see patterns and common threats um, that we use to create um, protections for you. And we would like you to leverage those protections that we create on your behalf. Um, there are common threats that we see here, and some of our customers have the expectation to you know, share with them the insights we see, because as a customer, you see solely what you have on your console or you have within your point of view. But then when you come to you know, the large scale AWS has in terms of infrastructure, you'd like to know what do you see, you know, what are the trends you see. So I'm just want to talk about some common threats that we see at the perimeter. Um, these threats include things like, oh, sorry, distributed denial of service. Um, distributed denial of service, or commonly known as DDoS, is essentially an attack on the availability of your application. Um, the reason why this is still a really common threat is because it's really effective. It's cheap, right? Um, why do you need to spend so much money to you know, have the same level of effect in terms of impacting somebody's availability when you can get something for debt cheap. So there have been you know, criminal organizations that have gathered around to provide this software as a service or DDoS as a service to you know, bad actors on the internet. And so this type of attack impacts the availability of your website or your application. Either that application it resides on the infrastructure layer, serving custom UDP or TCP ports, or that application resides higher up the stack on the application layer. The objective of this kind of attack is to ensure that legitimate clients or legitimate users are unable to access the website, right? And there are many reasons why bad actors we want to do this. Reasons such as financial, or maybe they have competitive, um, they want to try to get competitive advantage over you, or it could be that they are just testing their firepower to see you know, where they are um, against all that DDoS, because it's actually a competition between DDoS you know, um, organizations or DDoS bad actors. Um, the second common threat that we see is on the web application layer, and this attack is web exploits. Web exploits target or impact the availability, sorry, the integrity and the confidentiality of your application. Um, the idea here is simply to leverage existing vulnerabilities within um, a software stack. So if you build software using either your own um, intel um, intellectual property or you leverage an OEM, if there's any vulnerability within that flow of um, the software, bad actors are actually actively scanning to see what those vulnerabilities are and then exploit them. If you remember, around this time last year, um, we had to spend a lot of time in the office because of Log4j. Uh, we had to create mitigations for that because it really disrupted the industry. And that's not because Apache writes bad software. It's essentially because we are humans, we are flawed. And so there's an expectation that there may be things that you know, we do which we don't expect. And the um, outcome of that is vulnerabilities that could be exploited. Um, so this is another common threat we see. Um, the final common threat I would like to talk about today is um, botnets. Now, what we've realized is that with botnets, they are largely the contributors to distributed denial of service attacks. And they are also contributors to what we see with web exploits. And so you would notice that um, the same organizations that you know, launch DDoS attacks are actually have an incentive to leverage the um, vulnerable internet <coughs> devices. We live in, 20, in, you know, in the inter in information age in 2022. Um, and 
there are a lot of internet devices connected that may not have owners or users who would love to keep them up to, up to date. And again, bad actors look for this, try to acquire them and leverage them. So we have a team within the perimeter protection organization known as the threat research team. This team proactively looks for um, new threats in the wild from an AWS point of view, right? We really focused on protecting you as a customer so that we can create downstream protection such as managed rules for you to leverage. So let's start off with DDoS and what we've seen. Um, from Q1 through Q3 2022, we've seen about 670,000 volumetric events. A volumetric event could either be an infrastructure-based event, which occurs on layer three, layer four of the OSI stack, or it could be a layer seven request flood, so layer seven application attack. Um, and like I explained earlier, you know, it's just the objective is to restrain or to constrict or prevent legitimate clients from accessing your application. Um, there are different vectors involved in this. We have vectors such as TCP SYN. Um, on the web application layer, we have request flood, slow loris, um, TLS type of attacks. However, we are looking at the most common type of this kind of attacks. Um, if you notice, you see that there is a 39% increase from the same um, period last year. And this is due to what we attribute to um, largely proxies and botnets. Now, what we noticed is that there have been you know, a growth in the amount of proxies and botnets on the internet. What powers these proxies and botnets? Essentially, compromised or vulnerable devices across the internet. Um, botnets families such as Meris, um, which comprises of a lot of Mikrotik routers. So if you do have a router at home, you don't know who the manufacturer is, go check it out. It may be Mikrotik. Make sure you change your password, make sure you keep it patched, because um, there are always active scans to recruit your smart fridge, your smart oven, your smart TV into these networks. Or it could be your router. Your router has um, considerably higher compute power that could be leveraged in um, you know, probably even changing the proxy settings so that it can be used to obfuscate um, source IPs. So this is what we saw in terms of DDoS. And the top five vectors, um, or the most common vectors we see when it comes to DDoS, largely are request flood on the web application layer, right? Um, and then when we go further down the stack in the infrastructure layer, it's either going to be a UDP amplification attack or a TCP um, attack. Now, the common threats or common vectors we saw for those two type of vectors, for TCP particularly, we were sin flood. We have other type of CCP attacks, such as push hack, um, attacks, which we saw, excuse me, which we saw an increase in. Um, we also saw an increase in um, reset um, attacks, but largely the most common that we saw for TCP was TCP sin flood. Um, for UDP amplification attacks, you know, it still largely remains NTP, DNS for the most part. There are also a lot of other vectors, but these are the ones that we saw um, you know, the most. And regarding this type of vectors, you really need to understand that um, for the infrastructure layer, they're more deterministic. We can predict what the type of attack is. At the request, um, at the web application layer, it's a bit different. The bad actors can actually blend into legit um, requests and it's, you know, it takes a bit harder or a bit longer to actually distinguish between what is legitimate and what's not legitimate. So we really want you to understand um, what those common threats are and leverage the infrastructure that we provide to protect you. How do we protect you against this? We have a service called AWS Shield. AWS Shield is a managed DDoS protection service. Essentially, the point here is to protect you against some of those threats or all those threats that we saw. Um, it's available in two tiers, Shield Standard and Shield Advanced. With Shield Standard, we, pro we provide comprehensive protection against all infrastructure-based attacks when you use either CloudFront or Route 53. If you want to protect an L7 application, you need to use WAF and manage the WAF yourself. Mm. Now, some customers want more nuanced protection, and so they subscribe to our second Shield service called Shield Advanced. And Shield Advanced is a DDoS protection service that provides a wider array of protected services we cover services such as the Elastic Load Balancer family. Mm -hmm. We add in Global Accelerator. We add in Elastic IPs as well. Um, and some of the other benefits that Shield Advance provides is access to my team, um, a bunch of brilliant engineers who are incident responders, um, available 24-7 to assist you when there is a DDoS attack. We also provide cost protection during those periods where you have to scale due to an increase in demand, and we help recoup those costs or give a concession when you, know, you have scaled out. Um, and so that's the mitigation that we have for you regarding DDoS. 
Now let's take a look at the, common, the second common thread that we saw um, from the parameter. Web, web exploits. Web exploits, I mentioned earlier, uh, attack, is an attack on the integrity and confidentiality of your application. And the idea here is simple. When there is a sort of vulnerability, bad actors are trying to take the most important things, either through data exfiltration, or they try to change certain things, or they try to get maybe loyalty rewards, they try to just get important information from your website, right? And so how do they get this? They need a foothold into this. We provide a service called AWS WAF, or AWS Web Application Firewall. Um, there's a feature within that service called AWS Amazon Manage Rules. So we use the Manage Rules to tell us what were the most attacked um, vectors, or the most attacked um, exploits of vulnerabilities. And this is what the rule set told us, right? Um, and the common theme here is code injection. If you've taken a look at the OWASP Top 10 for 2022, it's been renewed, and so the new OWAS top 10 shows that the most common threat is code injection, because um, attackers would love to leverage the edge to get into those backend services that have those exploits. So they send things such as, you know, if you remember um, Log4j last year, they would leverage things like the JNDI to send certain kind of constructed exploits to elicit um, responses from vulnerable services. And so these are the, um, this is the breakout of what we saw last year. Um, and then we also have other um, attack vectors within this type. But the most important thing we would love you to know here is that we do have a protection or mitigation against this. And to mitigate this kind of attacks, we provide web application firewall. With web application firewall, we provide baseline protection, which essentially means that we are trying to cater to the common denominator within our um, customer base. And so this baseline protection provides you with something that you can start off with. If you have a more nuanced application type or use case, then you could leverage our use case specific rules. Now, the rules are not limited to the rules that AWS curates. And when I say AWS, the team that actually curates these rules are called the threat research team. Again, they're within the perimeter protection organization. Um, if for whatever reason the threat research team doesn't have those custom rules, you could always reach out to um, or use or leverage the AWS partners. I saw that we had a partner in here. So some of our partners create more bespoke rules, more nuanced rules, partners such as F5, Imperva, Fortinet. Um, they have years of experience in doing this, and some customers already have relationships with these um, third-party vendors, and they use them uh, you know, to just keep on that relationship. Finally, the AWS Web Application Firewall provides a really important mitigation um, rule set, which is called the IP reputation list. Unlike the infrastructure layer where the source IP could easily be spoofed because it's either being reflected or it's just you know, sending spoofed traffic, at the web application layer, it's very difficult, if not impossible, to you know, spoof your source IP. And so when you know what the source IP of an attack is, you will just you know, block it outright. That's where the IP reputation list comes in. And we curate that list learning from our threat intelligence team from what they see in the wild in terms of you know, the known bad um, IPs that are actually DDoSing AWS customers. And so these are the protections we have for you against the web exploits. Um, the final attack type or threat type that I would like to talk about is botnet malware. Um, remember I mentioned that botnet essentially is a group of, network, is a group of um, exploited or vulnerable internet devices. In order for those internet devices to be recruited for nefarious purposes, the bad actors have to leverage a malware. A malware is a set of instructions that is you know, executing a malicious intent. And so the bad actors would scan the internet, list the vulnerable devices, um, and list them into what is called a command and control center, a command and control network. Um, and they then send commands to those um, exploited devices to do whatever they want. It could be things like ransom, it could be DDoS, it could be you know, setting up, whatever. They, they have different choices at that point. They, they, and the, and the idea is it's an arms race between these you know, bad actors or cyber criminals on how much they can acquire. And they leverage things like the Meris or Mirai from a couple of years ago, you know, where there were IoT devices that were compromised and Mirai you know, just came on the scene and obliterated that entire space, becoming the top you know, botnet family. 
And so what we've seen is we use the threat intelligence of um, AWS by creating a system of distributed sensors across the globe. Again, you saw the massive infrastructure that we have. So we place sensors across the globe, and we listen to what's coming in over the wire from the world. So with that, we learn. We learn what these bad actors are doing. We learn things like the IP addresses. We learn things like the malwares that they drop on those you know, listening sensors. And then we do things with that. We create rules. We create rules that we share within um, services such as AWS WAF. We create rules that we share within services such as network firewall so that you as end users can just you know, benefit from what um, the hard work and experience that we are putting into this. Um, for those binaries or the malware that's been dropped on, the, on, you know, on those sensors, we actually share that data with the threat intelligence or threat detection service called Guard Duty so that they can improve their own you know, detection algorithm. And within AWS, we have a security community. We have threat intelligence that's been shared among each other so that we are creating the best value for customers. These are things that many customers may not know about, and that's why I'm just trying to peel back the layer a little bit. Obviously, I have to keep some secrets, but for the most part, I'd like you to know some of what we do for you. Um, now, when it comes to security, you may have seen this diagram before. It's called the shared responsibility model. The reason why I just want to quickly reiterate on this point is that um, when you are building on AWS, there's a responsibility that AWS has and a responsibility that you have. Our responsibility is security of the cloud, which essentially means that we are responsible for the infrastructure, we're responsible for creating content such as this, um, we're responsible for creating best practice and guidelines that you can use to improve your security posture. While your responsibility is to ensure that you leverage the experience that we have, um, you leverage the infrastructure that we've built, and you see um, you actually patch your systems or you know, secure your systems, because we can't do that on your behalf. There's still that shared responsibility between both of us. So I'm going to talk to you about two examples of how we protect you and how you can protect yourself. The second one is going to be a quick story on um, a customer using Shield Advance to protect themselves. How does AWS protect you? I mentioned earlier that we have threat intelligence that tells us when there are outgoing DDoS attacks. So the threat intelligence team can see when there is an EC2 instance, because it's within a backyard, we own, you know, we own the environment. So we can look through the VPC flow logs, which we use for billing on intra VPC, so intra AZ communications, intra AD communications. We have VPC flow logs for contextual data. We're not peering into your data to see what's going on. We just have an idea of the contextual data. And we see when a single EC2 instance is communicating with a known C2. When we see this kind of communication, we can shut that down. We can communicate with the customer using a team called Trust and Safety. Trust and Safety, or AWS Trust and Safety, is a team within AWS responsible for communicating with customers when they are violating the acceptable use policy or they are violating code of conduct that makes everyone within the AWS infrastructure safe. They tell these customers that your EC2 instance may be compromised due to an exploited vulnerability. You have to take action. If the customers don't take action, then cross and safety would have to escalate to the next level of mitigation. I want to tell you a quick story. This story is about a customer who had built a web application in not the most optimal manner. This happens for various reasons. Maybe they knew, but they had to quickly ship to prod, um, and they thought they could change later further down the line. Unfortunately, whatever reason it was, they were attacked by a sin flood. Now, if you look on the diagram, you see a network load balancer behind a web server. Not the most optimal architecture, because network load balancer is a low latency, high throughput service designed to create a massive pipe to your backend, just so you can receive as many connections as possible. Now, the network load balancer was not overwhelmed by this sin flood. However, the web application server was. Now, if they had architected in a much more um, you know, expected manner or best practice manner, they would have avoided this. However, you know, it was what it was. They reached out to us as the SRT, Shield Response Team. We had to bail them out by creating a um, mit mitigation for them, which is our responsibility. That's why you pay us. You know, that's why we have a job, to protect you. And after doing that, we told them, hey, listen, you need to change your architecture. And they said, no, no worries, we'll do that. That's fine, we'll do that. Cool. Um, Several months later, unfortunately, they had not done what we told them to do. Attack returned. Now, um, reached out to us again, SRT, we need your help, no problem. Could you rerun that mitigation you created earlier? We did that. 
right? Um, and they, we told them this time, listen, you still have to change architecture. We recommend CloudFront as per a best practice. But if you can't change it because of your architecture, your use case, put a global accelerator in there. TCP SYN flood can be protected with TCP SYN proxy. SYN proxy is available with CloudFront and Global Accelerator. So you need to protect your service against this too. They put the Global Accelerator in there. The next day, or several days after, there was a massive um, SYN flood of 225 million packets per second. Customer had no idea about this. We had to tell them, we were just attacked. We were like, oh, really? Yeah, yeah. The SYN, flood, the SYN proxy have protected you. They had no idea. And that's how we leverage, or you leverage, the AWS infrastructure by just you know, following the best practices. We understand you have different use cases, and therefore we want you to understand that there is a general way of protecting your application. Regardless if it's a game, it's a web application, whatever it is, you have to use this best practice that we have up here, the prescriptive guidance, right? Um, we're gonna share all the resources, so don't worry about taking the pictures. You have all the links below. Um, what I want you to know is that you have to leverage global isolation using edge services, and you also have to leverage elasticity or scaling within the VPC using elastic load balancer or using um, auto scaling, actually, and using auto scaling. When it comes to the web application layer DDoS protection, I would like to actually take a picture of these rules. Having these rules will protect you against 80% or, let me say 80%, most of the DDoS that we see. Reputation lists, rate limiting, and automatic mitigation. Finally, when it comes to protection of um, security, we are really interested in ensuring that you are protecting defense in depth, not just the perimeter protection services, but other services that come into play. Observability using things like Security Hub. Um, you also have to do not just ingress protection, but also egress protection using network firewall and the like. Um, with that being said, we've seen examples of how you, know, you can leverage AWS to protect your service. And now that you know if you don't leverage the best practices, you are actually preventing yourself from being protected by AWS. And that essentially tells you that if you don't prepare, you are planning to fail. With that, I will hand over to my co-presenter, Steve, to talk about um, threat CCs on the um, account level. Thank you, Steve. Thank you, Fola. Excellent, excellent, wow. Is that, do you guys find that helpful? Isn't that amazing? Great, thank you so much. Thank you, excellent. So how many people are AWS customers because you love the scalability across our global infrastructure? Yeah, right? And you love that you can just elastically spin up resources and use them on demand, right? Well, guess who else does? Bad actors, right? And so, you're in control of your account, and you get to do that, but you know, there are others that would want to perhaps leverage those same resources without paying the bill. Um, and perhaps there are you know, bad actors out there interested in your data, right? And so we want to be able to enable you to protect yourself and detect any kind of attempt to do this kind of thing, which is why we have a threat detection service, Amazon Guard Duty. <clears throat> so Amazon Guard Duty works by continuously monitoring AWS logs and networking activity to identify uh, unauthorized or suspicious behavior within your account, right? It does this through machine learning, anomaly detection, and threat intelligence from both AWS, as Fola talked about, and industry-leading third-party providers. What it generates for you are findings. And each finding has a finding type, which includes resources, and a threat purpose, which tells you the primary purpose of the threat, the type of attack, or the stage of a potential attack in progress. So tens of thousands of customers use Amazon Guard Duty to protect their accounts, uh, workloads, and data, which provides an uh, interesting thought. And so the thought was, I wonder if we could use guard duty uh, uh, threat detection uh, metrics to understand what the trending threats are, right? Anyone interested in that? Okay, so that's what we did. And so here's what it looks like, right? These are the top threat purposes along the bottom there for the top finding types. So to kind of uh, 
elaborate on that, right? So we have Amazon Guard Duty protecting services like EC2 and Amazon S3, right? We talked about compute and storage, um, which are common targets of bad actors, right? And so what we want to do today, we don't have time to dive into all of these, but I want to look at the top three, which compose 50% of the total findings. We're going to dive in to the top three threat purposes, understand what they are, and then we're going to look at the findings associated with those threat purposes. Okay. Now, we're also going to dive into uh, just the, the mitigation or how we can remediate some of these threats and some of the best practices to prevent them. So let's dive in. So I think he took pictures, but I can't see his videos. Okay, so the most common threat purposes <clears throat> were unauthorized access. Unauthorized access means that guard duty detected suspicious activity from an unauthorized individual. Okay, and so guard duty is going to alert you to that. Policy, that means that guard duty is detecting either configuration or behavior within the account that goes against security best practices. And then stealth means that guard duty has detected that uh, an individual or an adversary is currently trying to hide their actions by making configuration changes within the account, um, primarily disabling some kind of logging, right? And so th this is, these are the top threat purposes we're gonna look at. Let's look at the findings under unauthorized access. These findings centered around EC2. So we have EC2, RDP, brute force attack, and EC2, SSH, brute force attack. <clears throat> brute force attacks can be inbound. And this happened 98% of the time. So it, what happens is the EC2 instance is the target of the brute force attack, right? And so a bad actor has detected some open inbound ports that are exposed to the internet, okay? And they're sending a brute force attack. Of course, it's programmatic, right? Nobody's sitting there doing it manually anymore. <clears throat> and so <clears throat> once these ports are discovered through a scan, the, the um, brute force attack takes place. Now, <clears throat> as I mentioned, bad actors are interested in your resources. Why? Because you know, they need resources to perform brute force attacks. <clears throat> Am I doing something wrong? <laughs> Is there something I can do over here? To Are we good? OK. So they're interested in using your EC2 instance to perform a brute force attack, right? We don't want that to happen, but you know, 2% of the time, this happens. And so uh, guard duty will flag this as a high severity finding because the instance has likely been compromised, right? And immediate remediation is necessary. An inbound attack is a low severity finding, but still should be mitigated, obviously, right? Because a successful attempt to um, get uh, access, gain access to your EC2 instance can lead to a much more significant uh, security event, which um, we will discuss some of those later. But let's go on to an example. So in a typical VPC, we know the best practice is to place EC2 instances on the private subnet, right? Not expose them. If you have an application that needs to be accessed from the internet, you, send a, you put a load balancer in front of it, right? Put that in the public zone, as Fola showed you, and then let that take the traffic exposed to the internet. Right? So, and of course you can protect the load balancer with AWS WAF as uh, Fola uh, mentioned in, in uh, uh, Amazon CloudFront. So that's the best practice. But you know, that's for uh, application access. What about administrative access? Well, a common best practice, or not so best practice, a common practice is to put a bastion host into your public zone. Well, you do this to eliminate the exposure of all of your EC2 instances by putting just one and then restricting the traffic from that one uh, to your other managed EC2 instances, right? This might be a simple way to do administration, but it exposes that EC2 instance to inbound traffic from the internet, which could then make it vulnerable to the brute force attack, right? So how do we get around that? Well, anybody a fan of the 1980s Karate Kid movie franchise? Right? I like, the, uh, I like the quote from wise Mr. Miyagi that says, the best block is no be there, right? So don't expose inbound ports to the internet. Instead, use systems manager session manager, which allows you to connect through the AWS CLI without any inbound ports, 
exposed to the internet, and you don't even need to have a Bastion host then. Right? You can eliminate that cost altogether. Um, it also gives you a centralized place to control access to all your managed nodes through policy. And so this is really a great way to mitigate that and to prevent that uh, exposure to the internet. Let's move on to our next threat purpose. So policy. The findings for policy were IAM user root credential usage. What does that mean? Pretty much what it sounds like, right? The root credentials, which is the super user for your AWS account, which has access to all your resources, including your billing information, is being used to interact with AWS services. Anyone think that's a good idea? Probably not, right? So uh, Guard Duty's gonna flag that as a threat because this would uh, <laughs> be something that a threat actor would love to get a hold of, right? Um, okay, the other ones are centered around S3. So S3, block public access disabled. What does that mean? Well, S3 is one of our oldest services. And you know, so many things have evolved and new things have come out since S3. But one of the ways that S3 was used was to allow public access to your bucket so that you could have your, your data shared with other, other folks outside of your uh, AWS account. Well, no longer a good practice. In fact, it's not been a good practice for a while. And so the block public access setting enables you to do exactly as it says. However, if it's disabled, it makes public access possible, exposing, once again, your resource, your storage resource to the internet. Anonymous access granted means that you're allowing access to uh, unauthorized users to your S3 bucket. Not a good idea, right? Because you wanna know who's accessing, you wanna make sure they're authorized to access your bucket. So if the two of these public access is granted and anonymous access is granted, this could be access from anyone on the internet. Threat actors, they could plant something there. I mean, it's just not a good idea. Data could be exposed, that's unintended. So we wanna avoid that, and so Guard Duty flags both of these as findings, threat findings. Okay, so, you know, we talked about root credentials. We know we wanna protect our root credentials, so what's the best way? Well, obviously, you know, once you create your root credentials, usernames and passwords can only protect you so much. A, a second factor, a multi-factor authentication is the way to go. I recommend a hardware second factor that you can lock away and then put policy around, escalation, break glass procedures, to justify if that should ever need to be used, right? Once again, keep it away from threat actors. Another way to keep it away is to avoid creating access keys. Access keys are the way we access AWS services without a username and password, programmatically using the API, um, those access keys could easily fall into the wrong hands if not uh, securely managed. And then limit the use of the root credentials. There are very few reasons to use root account. Once you've set up your administrative roles, right, you don't need it. Um, there's, a, there's a list actually, which by the way, Fola mentioned at the end, we've got some resources for you. Um, one of them is going to talk about best practices for root account and we'll give you that list of things that only root can do. But for the most part, you don't need it. Lock it away. All right, S3 access, best practices. Again, we wanna reduce the surface area, right? Exposed to the internet. And so block public access. You can do that at the account level. When you do that, it blocks public access for all regions globally. I recommend doing that. That's the most effective way to block public access. Now, occasionally, you're gonna wanna share resources, static content, maybe a front-end application from S3, right? Don't you need public access to do that? No, you don't. Um, Amazon CloudFront, once again, allows you to make S3 a, a place where you can uh, 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 send people to through a secure connection and with an identity, okay? So in origin access identity, you can put policy around it, you can restrict it to certain buckets and even using a TLS protocol. So I recommend you do that. Also, if you want to grant access to other AWS services or applications, use IAM roles, right? IAM roles are uh, based on temporary credentials, right? You have to assume the role, you can expire the role session, and so you have much more control rather than using long-term credentials, which can be, again, um, borrowed by a bad actor, right? Um, 
And what you can also do is put policy for your IAM roles to implement privilege of least privilege access, right? The principle of least privilege. So use conditions to limit the actions of your roles to only under certain conditions and to only the resources necessary. Encrypt your data as part of your defense in depth strategy, right? KMS keys um, are really the best way to encrypt your data. Customer managed keys give you an extra layer of protection. You can put P policies in place that uh, someone, if they were to gain access to the bucket itself, would also have to be, have permissions to that KMS key in order to decrypt the data and make it useful. So encrypt your data. Okay, let's talk about stealth. So with stealth, as I mentioned, you have a bad actor trying to stop logging uh, of access to your S3 objects, right? So server access logging lets you know any time an object within the bucket is being accessed. When server access logging is disabled, guard duty will bring that up as a threat. Why? Because you have no visibility now, right? There's no way to audit who's accessing your data. And so this could uh, mean that you know, your account has been compromised, or it could mean your credentials have been compromised. It could also mean that you have overly permissive access that needs to be remediated. And so this is uh, something that whether you have um, just you know, common data or if you have even uh, worse off sensitive data in your buckets, you definitely need to have a log. Um, I recommend using, um, using CloudTrail data events if you have highly sensitive data in your bucket to log. Um, but the first, the first thing you need to have is uh, you know, server access logging or some kind of logging enable for your bucket, right? You can't manage what you can't see. Um, and so by all means, enable that. Um, and then how do you detect if server access logging has ever been disabled and remediate quickly? AWS config, right? Config manage rules make it easy because we've already created them for you. And you can just implement those rules and they constantly audit the, um, the configuration of your bucket to determine whether or not logging has been enabled. Once it has been disabled, uh, you can then have an automated remediation step and this is what that would look like. So if AWS config is seeing your S3 bucket and server access logging has been disabled, it'll trigger the automated remediation which is, by the way, already been uh, created for you. The rules have been created for you. The automation documents have been created for you in Systems Manager. And so they will trigger using the configuration uh, that you plug in for your bucket, the uh, server access login to be re-enabled. You never have to do a thing. There's no programming, there's no coding involved here. You just have to set it up. I mean, you know, we can't decide to turn it on for you, but we have put it there uh, for you. And so you'd want to know that happened at least, right? Even if you didn't have to do anything, it, the automatic remediation has happened. If you want to know it happened, you can set up an event rule. That event rule then can, again, without code, trigger a simple notification service to send an email to your security operations and let them know or let you know what has taken place. Again, automatic remediation is absolutely essential when we're talking about um, protecting resource and resource configuration and security. All right, now I wanna turn our attention to kind of a different, uh, a different data point, okay? So up until now, we've been talking about guard duty. We've been talking about um, threats that were detected, the top threats across the guard duty findings. But another thing that I thought would be really interesting is to talk to our customer incident response team. Anyone familiar with the customer incident response team? Okay, so they're a, a group of professionals in AWS that provide threat detection and incident response support, okay, for customers who are ex actively experiencing a security event on the customer side of the shared responsibility model, right? So they help with things like ransom and ransomware, privileged escalation, unauthorized resource usage, and so customers call them and they help to remediate or to uh, triage the situation. And so what I wanted to do was focus in on one of those types of events for the purpose of helping you to understand how they unfold and then 
what the primary, what the, what the most common cause of this type, these types of events, and really all, of, all security events that they've seen at AWS is. So we're gonna look at ransomware. Ransomware, ransom, data destruction, these are all forms of ransom uh, security events. Anybody concerned about ransomware or ransom events? Yeah, it's been in the news a lot. It seems like uh, threat actors are becoming more sophisticated, right? Commoditizing ransomware um, types of attacks. And so, you know, we can't let our guard down. We have to be constantly um, checking to see, you know, are we uh, mitigating that risk? And by the way, that's one of the resources. Um, we don't have time to talk about uh, ransomware in this session too, too much, but we do have a lot of good information on our website, so I've included that in a list of resources at the end. Please take a look at that. Um, now, also, we have sessions here at reInvent on, uh, on mitigating the risk of ransomware with AWS security control, so check out WPS 305 if you're interested in that. If you're interested in uh, uh, data protection and application recovery strategies for ransomware events, then check out STG 305R1. Um, so that's available for you this week. But what I want to do is, again, just touch on a high level of the unfolding of these events so you can see the pattern. So ransomware, we're familiar, we're pretty much familiar with ransomware, right? Some of them are listed there in that uh, graphic. So with ransomware, an unauthorized user gains access, and this is in the context of AWS, okay? They gain access to uh, customer accounts through phishing emails or browsing a malicious website and picking up some form of malware or capturing uh, that captures their credentials. And then they typically will, customers will log into an EC2 instance or access it from an endpoint outside of AWS where the malware gets deployed. Okay, once that malware is deployed, it creates that staging ground typically EC2 instances are not operating in isolation, right? So they typically have access to a database, Amazon RDS perhaps, other EC2 instances, maybe even S3, right? And so the malware can encrypt that data, right? There's a pathway for it. Pathways to data are very important. Pay attention to your pathways to data, right? That's one tip. Um, because unnecessary pathways to data or overly permissive pathways to data create a pathway for potential malware, right? And so once the data is encrypted, we know how it, it works, right? The bad actors then make a ransom demand to have that data decrypted. All right, so what is a ransom event, right? A ransom event, it, it's somewhat similar, um, but unauthorized users gain access, uh, perhaps um, unintended uh, keys are under unintended disclosure to AWS access keys or secrets, say database passwords or something like that. What they typically do is they want to access the data and exfiltrate it to another location. Once it's in that location, they're going, and typically it's sensitive, highly sensitive data is, is obviously the target, right? Once it's in the, a separate location, they will uh, make a claim and uh, show that they have the data and then, of course, hold that data for ransom until the ransom is paid. Data destruction. What is data destruction? Well, it's actually also a ransom event. Um, unauthorized users gain access in a similar fashion, right? Unintended disclosure of credentials. They start deleting data from your data resources. So RDS, S3, maybe EC2 volumes. Um, so once that data is deleted, they'll take responsibility. They'll send uh, a message to the, um, the account owners and let them know, hey, you know, we've deleted some of your data, and they make a ransom demand, okay? So <laughs> whether or not the ransom gets paid, let me just tell you, this data is gone, okay? So <laughs> how do we, um, safeguard against that, right? Obviously, we talked about many things already. Uh, we talked about pathways to data. We talked about uh, limiting the exposure of your EC2 instances um, and, and how you access EC2 instances. It's got to be done securely. Um, but this is 
also points to a, a, a need to have a clear backup and recovery strategy, right? A tested backup and recovery strategy, okay? I, I don't wanna tell you, and I don't have the number, but I was told that many customers who experience this kind of event don't have a backup. They don't have one. So, <laughs> look, without a backup, nobody wants to be the target of, uh, of a ransom event or any other kind of security event. But without a backup, you can't recover, right? So you gotta have those things in place. So all of these things are avoidable. This happens to be the most common scenario, by the way, which is shocking, isn't it? But all these scenarios that I mentioned were 100% avoidable using some of the best practices we've already talked about, right? Um, now, <laughs> here's what the customer incident response team told us. Hopefully you saw a pattern um, throughout each of those types of events. Here's what they said. The unintended disclosure of security credentials and secrets. 100% avoidable, right? 100% avoidable. How do we manage our credentials? Are we using the root account? Are we using long-term credentials? Do we have a way to safeguard our accounts? Um, with, with simply doing a better job of managing credentials, um, the, these events could be completely avoided. And so AWS has a service called AWS Health Dashboard. Is anyone familiar with AWS Health Dashboard? Anyone? Yeah, a couple people? Okay, so AWS Health Dashboard can scan popular code repositories. And what it does is if a developer accidentally uh, exposes credentials, they would um, end up, or this would end up creating an event within the AWS Health Dashboard that you can act upon, you can action upon, you can actually delete that exposed credential immediately. Again, automated remediation. Automated remediation is the key, okay? We don't have time, if, if credentials are exposed, there's no time to discover using you know, a human and then go and remediate that credential. Every moment counts. And so, isn't it amazing that with just a very little, and by the way, this solution is out there on GitHub. So you can deploy this into a, an account, play with it, test it out. Um, and I know that there's other types of solutions out there, but it can automatically delete the public exposed key using uh, Amazon Event Bridge, using step functions and, and serverless Lambda. And again, all that code is out there if you wanna look at it. Um, it's not very complex. It can query CloudTrail to see what those, what that uh, credential has recently done, what that identity has recently done, and then send you an email or send your security operations an email letting them know what that recent activity was and that that credential was remediated, deleted, neutralized the threat automatically. So automatic remediation is the key. Well, we're getting to the end of our time and I wanna just review some key takeaways. Right? Hopefully you realize through all of this uh, that the data is telling you that, hey, AWS has your back, right? We have a lot of protection in place, as Fola mentioned, protect, to protect you from threats coming from the internet um, and to give you the tools to protect your applications uh, and your infrastructure. But it's up to you as well, right? It's a shared responsibility model, so you have to eat your veggies. Do the things you know that keep good security hygiene to avoid being uh, vulnerable to these types of threats that we've talked about today. So, Fola mentioned the DDoS prescriptive guidance. He showed you a slide with that. We also have a white paper that we've got a reference at the end for you to uh, look at and read more about. Um, the AWS WAF managed rules, which has all the goodness of our threat research that we're constantly in motion, um, putting uh, better, you know, in enhanced rules out there so that you can uh, protect your web applications exposed to the internet. Um, and then from an account perspective, we talked about limiting the, the use of root accounts, but also I don't wanna uh, 
I don't want to lose you on long-term credentials. I know long-term credentials sometimes need to be used. And when you do, you've got to rotate those um, access keys, right? But for the most part, avoid using long-term credentials. Use um, IAM roles, right? They're much more secure, and there's really not too much of a need anymore for long-term credentials. <sighs> Ensure that uh, any pathways to your EC2 instances are secured. You know, so don't just trust, because of the network location, that the EC2 resources that you have in your account are secure. Put additional protections in place. Put uh, zero trust network access and zero trust network um, best practices in place. Um, and protect your EC2 instances, as well as your S3 buckets, right? How many people are familiar with um, access uh, points or, or, or gateway endpoints? Yeah, yeah, so you can apply policy to those to scope down who and what has permissions to those resources. I, I absolutely recommend you doing that. Those are guardrails, um, and you can also put the guardrails in place when uh, applying the block public access. Did you know that you can apply a, a service control policy that restricts the ability to change block public access? Yeah, you can do that. So. Don't, don't allow IAM users or, or uh, identities to change that setting. And then you don't have to worry about you know, it becoming public accidentally before you realize it, right? And so use a defense in depth strategy is what we're getting at. We mentioned a number of things. Fola mentioned about protecting your infrastructure. I talked about um, encryption for your uh, resources and, of course, uh, zero trust uh, network access. And, there's so many other things that we couldn't get to today, but um, put that defense in depth strategy in place. And then I talked briefly about having a, a tested backup. AWS backup will allow you to uh, use policy-based um, backup. You can enforce backups across your organization if you're not familiar with AWS backup. And uh, it, it is uh, much, much easier to do that uh, using policy. Um, you can also store it in uh, secured encrypted vaults that are immutable, um, so threat actors would not be able to uh, leverage that data. In the event that you ever had a, a loss of data, you would have data available to you in your tested backup. And then one other thing is, you know, having a recovery strategy is great, but a tested failover and recovery strategy is better, right? Um, if, if it's not tested, don't trust it. And it's essential to use a tool that makes that easy. So we have Elastic Disaster Recovery. We know that there's other partner solutions out there that make it easy. Um, whichever one you prefer, just make sure you use one and have that failover uh, uh, and recovery strategy tested, okay? Um, I think that's all the time we have. Um, Fola and I are gonna come down. Um, these are the resources that we wanna share with you. I'll leave that slide up. But I'll just ask you to please uh, help us with feedback uh, from the session survey. Let us know how this is helpful to you so we can, uh, again, share with you uh, even better in the future. Let us know where we can improve. We're going to come down at the front. Hopefully, um, we can take a few questions at the front. But uh, that's it for our session. So thank you, everyone, for your time. Thank you for your attention. Really appreciate you coming. And have a great rest of your week at reInvent.